Uh, but today I want to talk a little bit about business structures as we go through this. Um, kind of related to uh, uh, succession planning a little bit, but uh, just generally some highlights of what we should be thinking about long term. Um, when we actually get into this and some unique things that we can do with them. And mostly uh, kind of the, some of the common planning that I've seen uh, happen out there within the ag community at least. And uh, we're going to start, it's obviously a little bit high level. It's a very difficult topic because everybody's in a different situation. They want to do different things. Um, and not every situation is going to work like this, but this is something that commonly happens and we're going to go fairly high level. Just kind of focus on the concepts and, and maybe what's going to work for you. Uh, and Rick had handed out those little cards on your table and so I do want to point out as well that uh, for a lot of these topics I've tried to, uh, tried to do more and more writing and get it out to you so that uh, it is on that website as well. So if there's something that piques your interest, uh, hopefully it's there. And if not, you can certainly give me a call after. So we'll talk about common succession strategies, some of the plans, some tax considerations, and some things to think about before you're going in. But just to kind of see where we're at, I just wanted to see, just show of hands, maybe how many of us are the founders of our business in the room? How many are second generation? Third generation or more? Okay. So obviously when we start to talk about this, I think things have changed quite a bit as we've started to see, especially this last 10 years. Um, Financials are different, uh, uh, we're kind of operating a different picture, markets have been reasonably good depending on the industry that you're in. Uh, and it is quite a thing that a lot of these businesses have gone through changes in the past and parents these days are thinking, I don't want to do this again the way that my parents did this with me, I think we can come up with something a little bit better. And so I think we're starting to see more proactive planning but kind of the key idea is the longer we can get into this, uh, it, there's two types of, or there's two parts of succession planning, there's kind of this ongoing process and then there's an actual transactional side and you want to make sure the process is kind of underway so you can get that transactional side right for, for what's going to work for you and your family. So this may be familiar, I just wanted to kind of highlight it. I know I remember it with, uh, with my dad for sure. You're, you're starting the succession plan, you're walking around the farm, uh, you've, you've been there your whole life and you're out there, you're ha sharing a moment and you're talking and dad says someday, uh, child this is all going to be yours. Now here's a potential implication for, um, uh, for some miscommunication. What dad was talking about, he, dad said, you can have all the hay you want, that's all going to be yours. And the child thought, oh, someday I'm going to get all this land. Um, again, we've got to make sure that we are clarifying expectations and things as we start to work through this. And I, uh, you don't have to kind of look at every box, but it's just to kind of highlight what's all involved when we start to go through this and this is on our website as well but a ton a ton of stuff that uh, we do have to go through and kind of take into consideration when we talk about this uh, retirement plans succession plans uh, estate plans um, investment plans all kinds of things that do go into these and so uh, it is on the website i believe it's from manitoba ag originally but uh, just some things we do need to keep in mind as we work through it but there are some keys that I think we can kind of focus on and some things that uh, uh, we do need to make sure before we actually get to the business structure side that we think about. I think one of the main things is, is our goal to actually transfer this to the next generation. I think that's something that, it sounds a little bit redundant, but it's something that we do need to think about. Is this a business that we want to make sure we're passing on and we're putting in the right place to make sure it can pass on uh, and kind of make sure that it's going to work out for the incoming generation. Do we have a successor? Have we told them yet? Uh, do they know they're the successor? Do they know that they want to come back? Uh, is that kind of there or is this kind of just something you've always planned for? Uh, have you clarified those expectations on what everyone sort of expects out of this business uh, going forward? Uh, these are very, very difficult conversations to have and kind of going through my own as well, it's very difficult when you sort of sit down with family and try to get to this. Um, but there are some things that I think we can put in place that simplify those conversations um, the key is to have them and keep working forward. Do you have a strategic plan as part of this uh, business operation? And then where's our business actually at financially? And so the guys will talk a little bit more after this about that, but uh, are we profitable now in the long term? If we're not, what do we need to make sure we do to get there? And then you get to this point about where do you, when do you actually come to transfer this farm? So uh, can you wait till mom and dad are late 90s and say you know now we're going to pass this thing on and uh, again maybe there's a generation there that they're looking to skip to or pass on to that maybe there's a generation coming up that's uh, equipped to do this as well and so these things do happen this happened a ton in previous planning where um, 
again, no one wants to make a decision early and you do have those situations. This is probably about three years ago, I got a call from a, from a gentleman and he'd said, uh, you know, I'm thinking about doing some succession planning. Uh, we're kind of talking about how we want to work things out. And I said, oh, okay, yeah, it's, it's never too early. And he said, uh, uh, and we kind of talked, I asked him a bit about where the farm's at and, and if he could tell me about it and asked him how old he was and he said 68 and I said, yeah, it's a good time to start, uh, start working things in and he said, no, no, um, or I asked him how old his kids were and he said, uh, he gave me their age and he said, but it's actually my dad that has the land and I'm trying to get it into my farm and his dad was uh, 92 and starting to make these decisions and as we get through these processes, the older and older we get and the older generations we work with, it, uh, they do make different decisions as they start to get up there. So something we need to make sure we have plans because I don't think this next generation is, is kind of going to hold on as, as much as uh, the previous ones did. And it's important, I guess, as we get into this as well to think about strategy and what we want to do long term. So uh, generally strategic thinking, I think, can be boiled down to three simple, simple things to work through. You can kind of talk a little bit about where has the business been, uh, talk a little bit about the history of the business and the operation, talk a little bit about where we're at today what's our reality today and where are we going to go with this in the future as kind of the last one and what can we actually do with this long term. And these are difficult conversations to have but I think you can kind of focus it around the future growth and things, things working out. I think there's some three keys that uh, we've kind of worked with on our farm that, that do help us at least uh, try to get to, that, to get to that point where it's what makes being in business together great, um, uh, how can our work together and business be even better and then what can we do now and in the long run. And then I think being inclusive is pretty key as this as well, so that generally there's a lot of things that old planning, we used to try to work around people, not include everyone in these decisions, and these things, those always seem to backfire. And these plans, as we're working through them, even this business structure and the transactional side, uh, I think as farmers, we always want to have the perfect plan. We're used to trying to make things perfect every year, uh, but there's no such thing as a perfect succession plan. You got to keep working on the process. It's progression, not necessarily profession or perfection. And then there's no such thing as agreement from what I've come across. It's very, very difficult to get 100% agreement on everything. What you're trying to get rid of is certainty, or you're trying to get to is certainty and clarity. And these things add a lot of stress relief, at least. I think these are the things that really eat away at, at families when they aren't there, when you don't know what's going to happen, when there's not certainty and there's not clarity in what will happen. And, Maybe not everyone's happy with what happens at the beginning, but if you can get to these, I think it really takes that long-term pressure off. And then there's the next gen coming in. I don't know how many of you are Star Wars fans or have your tickets uh, for the new next movie, but uh, they've got to think about this as well as they're coming back in. Do they have a financial plan uh, as they come back to this? Do they have uh, availability to expand, to grow, to do what they want with the business? Uh, do they have the business model? Are the things changing that they can do differently? Uh, and then is there some reason that they know why they want to do this? So I always come back to this one that, uh, again, he's a, a young gentleman. I, I tried to help out. He was, he was fairly young. He was 24, and he was looking at coming back into this. He'd been running his parents' dairy for the last uh, three years since he was 20. He was basically running this thing on his own, and they'd set up the house across the road so they could kind of keep an eye on him. Uh, and they wanted a full $10 million bill out of this business uh, to make him carry it to pay for it. And, I kind of looked at his financial plans and I was saying, you know, man, this is, you could buy two Tim Hortons for this and probably do yourself a, a favor here. Um, if you're not going to kind of work to get this, is this something you actually want to do? And to answer the question, you're all thinking, yes, he was Dutch. I don't know. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. He was, we were in Lethbridge yesterday and I, I say it just to give Herman a hard time, but we were in Lethbridge yesterday. I said that and there's just daggers coming at me, but uh, um, again. These things are kind of, you want to make sure you've got your young Padawan coming in and they go to the light side, not the dark side. You want to make sure that this thing's going to work for you. And then uh, kind of the last one before we get to the business structures. But there's, so there's all these things that, uh, again, there's the process side of this before we get to the transactional side. But kind of this goal setting, priority setting, uh, what can we do there? Uh, the operating plan, obviously working them in, having an operating plan that's going to take over. Um, a risk management, labor plan. Um, and then we can actually get to this ownership thing. And so uh, Rick had mentioned uh, sort of a, a mentor of mine, Merle Good, and so he's the one that's really got me thinking about how we can start to, start to break some of these businesses up and uh, obviously fairly infamous in this community. Um, something that uh, uh, he really got me thinking about was these three bubbles. So if you've seen him, uh, I definitely stole this from him, but something to think about. 
what is the business of farming? We kind of break it out into these three, three separate businesses from what uh, I've seen and working with Merle as well. Uh, you have that actual operating business. So you have your operating company, your breeding herd, your equipment. Um, this is kind of the focus and something I want to talk about uh, as we get to that next generation uh, and certainly the operating debt that goes with that. And then you've got the land. We've seen these things growing in value, uh, adding complexity to our farm management, our business plans, um, what we want to do uh, sort of to pass things on. I think there's some things that we can start to think about a little bit differently here. And then hopefully as a piece of this, there's some kind of off-farm assets as well, some, some planning sort of outside the farm, some things that may have worked. Um, but for the next generation coming in, I think what's kind of key initially, at least when we're starting to talk out or when we're starting to get them in or starting to work is how quickly can I kind of get a handle on this operating business? Uh, I think one of the common things that used to happen, we used to lump everything together. Um, and then you'd get siblings and their non-farming siblings all owning shares or all owning a piece of, a, of an operating business. And I don't think that this really works out well over the long term from what I've seen. This causes a lot of issues that I think when you're coming back or looking at a business, it's how can I get control of this operating business and try to get access of land and things like that after, not necessarily um, how do I get the full piece, the full picture. And so that's kind of the philosophy I've been working on to start as, as we start to break out some of these structures. Uh, but there are two things. Again, we were kind of in, uh, uh, there's a few more college students yesterday, so just to kind of cover some rules, most of us may know them, uh, but if they don't come up, uh, lifetime capital gains exemption rollover, I just want to talk about quickly, because for some of the planning things I'll talk about, I'll mention them, uh, and just so we have some background info. So for the capital gains deduction, uh, this is obviously a very, very key one. Uh, the planning used to work a lot. We'd hold on to these exemptions. Uh, now it's up to a million dollars uh, exemption for qualified farmers that they can use this to offset any capital gains on land, farm property, um, and uh, farm shares as well in corporations. Uh, so they can use this to offset the capital gains increase there. And it always used to work that we'd wait until, uh, as farmers, you'd wait until you, someone passes away, you'd use the capital gains on death to bump up the land value, transfer the land. And I think planning these days, they're starting to see a lot more of it get used in terms of capital gains, where it's getting used prior to this and we can do some creative planning things with these exemptions. And then there's the other one that's kind of key that makes things a little bit unique uh, and helps us kind of keep farms together is the rollover rules. So for qualified farm property, uh, you can roll property to the next generation on a tax deferred basis. So at your tax cost, you can roll this land to the next generation if you're a qualified farm. And so as we, we break it down, there's a number of different operating structures and this is what makes it difficult to present on and difficult to kind of talk about because everyone's at a different place and the vast majority of our agriculture industry, our farmers are still sole proprietors, partnerships, um, and partnerships and companies, we can do some very, very similar things. So when we go through this, I'll talk a bit about more about companies, but there's th very similar things we can do with partnerships. Um, I kind of want to go through the concepts, but uh, basically a proprietorship, Fairly simple, we can kind of use our, uh, our farm income to offset our, um, any kind of income. We just file personal tax returns. Partnership, I'll talk a little bit about. Um, I think one of the keys going forward that we do need to start focusing a bit more on is partnership agreements and what we can do there. Uh, splitting income, obviously a key objective of being in a partnership. Um, and then there are some other keys there that I'll talk about. A new one that's popping up and certainly it's, it's occurring more and more in the cow-calf industry as well as joint ventures. I have some ideas on uh, how we can use those going forward as well. Uh, corporations, um, obviously the key is to access that small business deduction. Um, and then, uh, and also for liability, if you're farming land right along the highway and you've got uh, cows that, and you've got shoddy fences, I mean, again, liability is certainly an issue for corporations as well. And then co-ops, I won't really talk about. We're starting to see more and more opportunities with co-ops, but um, again, uh, for the most of us, not really not really a big issue. And then there's two ways that we're starting to see this kind of from a philosophy standpoint, I think at least that we're starting to see people set these things up that we either see them setting them up as when we're sort of bringing that next generation in or bringing a partner in, you're seeing them set up as sort of two businesses operating side by side. So sometimes you'll see them operate and they'll set uh, the child or the incoming generation or their partner up with their own company and farm it side by side. And these have their sort of unique arrangements as well. Um, often the kind of the deal is we're going to use mom and dad's equipment, uh, we'll buy land, um, and then you start to get to a place where 
at the end of this, the child's building up wealth in their company and mom and dad's uh, uh, equipment's depreciated and do they want to buy mom and dad's tractor at the end? Probably not because it's an old piece of crap and now they want to go out and buy a Kubota. Uh, so you do start to see uh, certain issues that are out there that um, again are starting to pop up with that one. And then kind of when do we actually transfer these? So there are some key benefits that we can actually start to set these up and you can retire into those companies as well. Um, or there's another one, you start to see them where we're going to keep everything together and we're going to work together um, and kind of build this business up and sort of set up, set up operating agreements where we're all working towards kind of one common goal. Um, both fit for different situations. It's kind of figuring out what philosophy is going to work best for you. And then we can kind of get into that business structure planning about what's going to work for you, your family, your uh, partners that may not be family, and, and how we can set this up. And so like I said, I'm going to try to talk about concepts and so not going to go too detailed at least. We'll talk a bit about concepts and if there's things there, I'll be around after to chat and then uh, on the website hopefully I've gone into some more detail on things. Um, but basically a partnership is formed. You have two people that decide to make profit. Um, and there's three types of partnerships. Mostly going to jump over this. Most of us are general, uh, sort of general partnerships and then there's the professionals, uh, limited liabilities, the doctors, the dentists, the accountants, lawyers. Um, but basically there are some unique things that I think we can start to focus on a little bit more uh, with partnerships. Uh, basically fairly simple tool, most of us are aware of it, the vast majority of the ag industry are kind of, kind of using these partnerships. Um, you don't actually need a written agreement to be a part of one, you can just sort of be part of one, but uh, there are some unique things to think about is that if we don't have these partnership agreements, technically uh, when a partnership ends, uh, everything's deemed to have been disposed if you have two separate partnerships and so, you know, a one page with signatures on it that in the event of my partner's death, this operation continues to go on. Uh, sort of some of those keys to keep in there. Uh, and then you can't necessarily just jump from a sole proprietor to a partnership. You can't just say, oh, I was farming this day as a part or by myself and now I'm farming uh, with, uh, uh, with my brother this day. Uh, you have to actually file a special election, otherwise you're deemed to have sold things into the partnership. And so there are some keys to make sure as we're, we're out there farming. I know we do it on our farm where uh, we, mostly I think it's just to try to confuse Stats Canada where I have land that I farm with my dad and then I have land that I farm with my dad and my uncle and then they have land they farm together and then they have stuff they don't farm together. So it is something that uh, again farmers do tend to get creative in these and, and start to play around with. Um, and then when we do want to quantify things as well, having a list of what's in, in and out of that partnership becomes key too so that again if we're working someone in, we have a record of that and we can start to come up with some unique ideas of, uh, of how we can transfer things. So fairly simple, and I'm going to talk about how we start to see partnerships get used or how we work people into partnerships, but uh, like I mentioned, sort of the history, and I kind of want to work this through the life cycle. You've got your sole proprietorship, and then maybe you've got someone coming up that's the next generation, or you've gotten married and you're adding a spouse to your partnership. Um, basically, you form the partnership. It doesn't necessarily have to be 50-50 at the beginning. Uh, they can bring things to the partnership. They can bring other capital items. Labor can be qualified. Um, if you do want to get to that 50-50 arrangement to income split, you can gift them some things beforehand, um, put it in the partnership together, get to that 50-50 contribution. Or you can set up partnerships with all kinds of different situations, doesn't have to be equal, you can set it up so that it's 90-10, uh, 80-20, whatever is going to work for you as you go forward. Uh, but I do think it is key as we go forward to start adding some of these partnership agreements uh, to our businesses and actually understand what we're putting in place. And so then I think one thing now, and I'll talk a bit about it from the corporation standpoint as well, but one of the common ones, what if we want to add a partner going forward? So what if we want to bring someone else in and basically kind of retire out of this business? One of the common things that you do see is a bit of a partnership freeze, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but basically, when it happens in partnerships, typically mom and dad are looking kind of at the tax situation, they're looking long term, uh, at least in the cow-calf side, we want to sell our herd out over time. So what tends to happen, you tend to sell bred heifers on a, on a tax basis at least, you sell, sell them the bred heifer, then you put a certain value on it and then when it calves out, uh, they've got two animals now that, and you're only paying tax on the one you sold, so there are some creative ways we can do this over time. But with it, you can set up a partnership agreement as well and start to freeze interests. Uh, so you can do it with a corporation, I'll talk a bit more about that at corporations, but with a partnership at least, you can freeze the value of what your 
partnership contribution is at today and sort of set a fixed value uh, and give that incoming partner an idea of what they've got to buy off you over time. Uh, and they can start to use their capital, um, their income in the partnership to buy that out over time and they can take the future growth on that partnership going forward. So they can take all the future growth of income, uh, retain that, or you can set up a portion of it. You could take half the growth, half not the growth, and set it up um, so that they can actually buy that fixed value, the equipment, the breeding herd from you over time and sort of dissolve you out of the partnership. But basically it allocates those two, two uh, the class A and the class B interests and the class A are the growth ones going forward and the class B are so those fixed ones. Some concerns used to happen a lot, especially uh, uh, sort of where there's more established farms uh, in certain places like here, uh, southern Alberta, where some of these values got frozen too soon. And then you had tremendous increases and mom and dad have kind of gone in their retirement, they're out of the business and now they have to go back to their kids to sort of say, uh, you know, now we've got no income coming out of this, can you, can you help us out? So something you want to be cognizant of is setting those values long term that you're not going to freeze mom and dad out in their retirement. But the key for this too that we see a lot in the cow-calf industry at least is uh, starting to work into this partnership role. Uh, so it is, again, I'll talk a little bit about companies. Um, Companies, uh, you don't, not necessarily encouraging, it's just one of the common strategies that are out there. Uh, for cow-calf, typically, you've got someone working off the farm, uh, coming back into it. Um, basically, once they've formed this partnership with mom and dad, uh, you can start to roll this into a company, and I'll talk a little bit about how you can get your money out on a tax-deferred basis. But why would you want to consider incorporating in the first place? Um, again, there's limited liability. Uh, you have your small business deduction, so if you're growing, you're working off farm and you've got a fairly sizable business, uh, you can retain money in that corporation versus if you were paying potentially working off farm um, and selling your herd, if, you, if that jumped you up to the top marginal bracket, you'd only have 52% of your income to buy assets and move forward with. Uh, so it is really looking at your tax structure and where you're at and if you're consistently paying into those high marginal tax brackets, uh, it is something you may want to consider. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about what we can do differently with our capital gains, at least uh, as we start to roll this in. Um, although cautions as well, they are a bit costly to set up and then you're likely going to be paying fairly significant increased accounting costs as you go forward. Um, so it is something that you do have to make sure you're at the right size and it's going to work for what you and your family want to do long term. But basically when you actually start to look at incorporating this partnership, and this is usually what happens in succession planning, uh, you you uh, form that partnership, um, it's got the breeding herd in it, the equipment in it, and you take those shares and you just roll them into the company. Uh, if you hold that partnership for two years, you can defer the tax on that. And when you defer it in, you can also use your capital gains exemption to offset, the, offset it going into there. And you can, uh, or mom and dad, once it's in the company, sorry, uh, mom and dad can um, start to redeem it and use their capital gains exemption on the shares of the company and get money out tax-free. So I'll talk a bit about how we do that. But the key is that, again, you've held that partnership for two years and at least 90% um, uh, of the business was used principally for farming at the time of incorporation. And so again, this is kind of what the structure looks like, fairly simple, but you've got those partnership interests, those breeding herd, the equipment, uh, comes together, whether it's the farmer and their new partner, uh, whoever that may be, you roll it into the company, and then you kind of wind up your partnership here at the end. And out of this, so again, you can uh, basically get to that same thing, that same picture where you can freeze the company uh, and you can kind of create, instead of the partnership interest, you can create different classes of shares. So you can cre create uh, preferred share value, which is the fixed value of the, the breeding herd, the equipment that that day it was transferred in. And then you create the growth shares, so the growth that's going forward in that business. And basically over time, the incoming child or the incoming uh, partner can buy those shares uh, off, the, off the parents over time and start to cal allocate those preferred shares back to the, back to the whole farm. Um, and mom and dad can use their capital gains exemption on the sale of those shares to offset any kind of tax. So basically, you can, that's kind of the way that you can kind of get your breeding herd into the company and mom and dad can get some money out uh, without incurring significant tax costs. Um, again, this is kind of one that gets used commonly to kind of help them, help them fund and plan as they go forward. Um, and you don't have to necessarily set all value. Mom and dad can retain a certain amount of those gross shares and you kind of every family can kind of come up with what works best for them. 
And then there's the big land issue. So this is kind of the way that uh, I've started to see again, everyone wants to do different things, but uh, there's kind of these truisms that uh, have come up certainly in talking with Merle as well that uh, these are kind of the, the things that we start to see farmers think about at least. Uh, obviously a lot of security in our land base, that's uh, sort of what we rely on to make sure that if something goes wrong in our futures that we do have a big asset there that could support us. Um, we know farmers are going to die owning land, uh, just sort of a truism. It's going to happen uh, for the vast majority. Land is generally going to go to non-farming children in some, very, in some degree. Every family has to decide what's fair and what's equal for them, but uh, seems, to be a, seems to be coming up quite a bit. And then you got to decide what's the biggest issue for me as I go forward through this. Is it loss of control? Is it loss of uh, future equity? I'm trying to protect from the in-laws. Um, again, things to consider. But there's some unique things that we can start to do with companies. And again, you can do some very similar things with partnerships as well. And I think it is really keying in on separating that operating business from the land itself. But why, why not have one company when you can have two? So what we're starting to see in planning more at least is we're starting to see if we do have corporately held land that it's put into an asset by itself into its own company. Uh, farms can then access two small business deductions and pay low rates on each. And then they've got a land code that they can actually transfer to a non-farming sibling. Um, or if you don't want to put it in the company, and so I'm certainly not advocating that you put personal land into a company, um, you can do it with land as well separately. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about how we do that. But uh, basically, uh, we are starting to see more land. Oh, sorry, talk about that one. But we are starting to see more land being sold into companies to create shareholders' loans. Uh, so out of some of the previous tax changes that came up, this was a, a, bit, of a, uh, a bit of an issue going forward, but uh, it's been removed. And we are starting to see places where people are using those capital gains exemption. They'll sell one piece of land into their company to create a land co. And they'll take back a shareholder's loan. Uh, and so basically they can use that, to, uh, their capital gains, to offset the tax base of that. And basically create a tax-free shareholder's loan. Uh, and make a pension. And then they've got a land co that they can leave to a non-farming child. Uh, so again, it's an option that's out there. I don't advocate that you sell land into a, into a company. but we are starting to see more corporate land being bought uh, as people do it to create a shareholder's loan or as uh, the next generation comes in and they're looking at how do they buy land. Buying it through the corporation does seem to be a way that if you've got an off-farm job, if, you've got, uh, um, if you're kind of looking long-term, you can kind of reinvest at those small business rates to buy land at using 87.5% uh, of your income versus kind of 52% if you're paying at those high, high marginal tax rates. Um, but again, you got to make sure you're working with your advisors out there to make sure you're at the right spot for that. Um, and again, whether it's a land co or whether it's land individually, I think the key for that next generation coming in is making sure they're focusing on how they get ownership of their farm business. Uh, they can leave land uh, or things or land co's uh, to non-farming children, non-farming siblings in the future. But what we're starting to see a bit more of is leaving long-term operating leases back to the farm business as a percentage of this. And then uh, the farming children are sort of actively working on their siblings to say, you know, this is a really good long-term investment. Uh, you should kind of keep it around. Uh, but we are starting to see these places where long-term leases are being put in. So a 10-year lease that if they're getting land or a land co, they've got to rent it back to the farm business for a period of years. And then you, uh, unanimous shareholders agreements I'll talk about. Uh, they're there to kind of protect the weaker party. So in this case, sometimes it is that non-farming sibling. Um, and I want to sort of get farmers starting to think more about how we use these agreements, but uh, 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 they, are, uh, they are kind of a key tool as we go forward. And so that's kind of just what I what mentioned. But uh, the other thing that uh, does come up instead of those uh, long-term leases, you can put rights of first refusal on them, or you can put um, options on them. Uh, so there are things where uh, on those agreements and out of the shareholders' loans, or out of uh, unanimous shareholders' agreements, you start to see options being put on things that you know, in the event of uh, uh, if my child passes away or in the event of a marriage breakdown, I have the right to purchase that back for a dollar. Uh, there are some big tax implications to some of those options to be aware of, uh, but something to consider as well. So I do want to quickly highlight a few things that we can do with our shareholders agreements and what to think about as we use them. Uh, they're generally there to protect the weaker party, which does tend to be the non-farm child. Uh, so there's a few unique things with these agreements. Let's say, for example, you only have one shareholder in a company. All the shares were left to mom and she wants to set up an agreement 
before, uh, before bringing in others or before transferring shares. Uh, well, with only one shareholder, she can actually determine what's in the agreement. Um, and when the kids or new shareholders are brought in, they are then subject to those agreement terms. Uh, so if at that time they all dislike the terms when they're all brought in as new shareholders, they can all get together and vote to change them. These agreements generally are there to, again, protect that weaker party. It gives them a bit of a power when they're negotiating. Um, and again, remember with these agreements, uh, as we sort of go through the example, that they are there to protect uh, the weaker party to define control, define value, and define liquidity out of these uh, agreements. And this is, uh, again, uh, I don't have it up yet, but I'll try to have some shareholder stuff up on that website as well soon. But uh, basically a long list of things. Uh, you're there to protect in case of physical, mental disability, to define how money gets accessed and pulled out of the corporation or if it's a partnership agreement out of the partnership. Uh, you have unique things in there like shotgun clauses. If you know brothers can't get along, you can put in a shotgun clause where you can go to one partner and say, you know what, I'm going to buy you out for 500000 Or if you say no, you have to buy me out for 500000 So there's some unique things we can do. Um, you can put in clauses, what happens if we go into bankruptcy, what happens if one of my partners or one of my shareholders uh, passes away. Uh, so again, lots there that you can kind of work into these agreements. And the key is to understand and make sure everyone, uh, every one of those does agree to those. Uh, but this is kind of a unique one um, that, uh, that did come up, and uh, I want to highlight it at least. Uh, that uh, this farm, there's three brothers farming together. Um, I kind of talked with them, and actually I know their advisor fairly well, and so he kind of gave me the inside scoop. But um, basically three brothers are farming together. Um, one of them has a bit of marriage, or had uh, some marriage uh, dissolution of partnership, so they had a bit of a breakdown there. Um, and again, I mean, it wasn't, wasn't, uh, wasn't a malicious marriage breakdown, but uh, previous to this, when they set up their corporation, uh, everybody's spouses were included and they'd all agreed to this thing in the USA that if something big happened or if there's a disability or something, that the farm would uh, contribute to that at a rate of $30,000 per year. Um, and what happened, again, when you go through that, uh, they sort of value what everyone's assets are and the brothers were all wondering a bit about what the future of their business was going to be. And basically they had a few different values, so when they value it, they take a low value and a high value, and then they kind of come up with this midpoint. But basically they valued it that uh, her share will be about one point, or just slightly over $1 million. And um, again, that would have been sort of an instant payment that had to come out of that farm business. They weren't in the best shape, uh, so they were kind of struggling with how they were going to do this without sort of selling off a significant portion of the, of, the, of the plan. And their lawyer did have this in the agreement that, again, withdrawals were going to be limited to 30000 per year, and so they kind of put that in front to see if they can work out a deal on this. Um, I think a, a few other arrangements were made, but she had accepted this, and I think the other lawyers didn't really want to take the agreement to court. They likely could have challenged it had they, uh, had they kind of gone all the way through, and I'm not, not throwing it up there to say, you know, we should be cutting people out of, the, out of uh, estate planning with this at all by any means. If, you're, uh, if your daughter was taking over the ranch, marry some bum from Toronto, I'm not saying you should necessarily... <laughs> necessarily cut them out, but um, uh, again, they are there to sort of protect the business long term and make sure that uh, we are using these things properly, and luckily they came to an agreement out of this. Um, and if they didn't have this clause in here, they likely would have gone for the, uh, for the full amount initially. And so this one is one as well, joint ventures that we're starting to see pop up uh, a little bit as well. So there are some unique tax advantages here. Uh, but basically, I'll, kind of the main ones that I've seen, and I've seen it in cow-calf start to happen, and I've seen it mostly in the grains industry. Uh, but basically you get to a place where uh, it could be brothers, it could be sisters, brother, siblings, uh, it could be neighbors. Um, and it's something I've thought about for us. It's just sort of figuring out uh, who, could, who, I, who I could farm with and uh, who could deal with my stubbornness on the farm. But um, basically you have the kind of the core example. You had this group of farmers in, uh, that all came together. They were sort of lifelong friends and they were all at sort of a medium average size business and they were kind of looking at things. Uh, they were looking at how do they reduce their labor contributions to the business and they all came together and they decided to form a joint venture. So they put together, oops, they uh, put together basically all their equipment. Uh, if their equipment values weren't equal, they had to come to the table and contribute cash into the business. They kept all their land held personally uh, and they kept it all in their own name. Um, and then they basically set up an operating for them, they were, all in, they were incorporated, so they kept their companies, and they all contributed everything else to the new co, to the new venture, which was going to be operated by this joint venture structure. 
So they put everything in there, and they each take back a share of the income that their, uh, that their new co-company creates over time. So as they're farming together, they each take on roles. So one takes on the CEO, one took on the marketing role, one took on the production role. Um, and they get this agreement together that, again, they evaluate each other. Whoever's got the highest role does receive a bigger salary from their company. And then what's left over, they reinvest some to buy new equipment. Uh, and then they uh, take out a profit as a percentage of the owners each. And so with this, they kind of reduce their labor over time. Uh, they did have cattle as well. And so that way, if someone wants to take off for a week or two weeks in the winter, they've actually got some time to do that. Uh, so it is something that, again, they've admitted at different times. You've got to put your, put your ego away and you've got to make sure that you're willing to work for the, the greater good rather than sort of the individual business. And they've said that, you know, at certain years they've taken less than they would have got if they were on their own. In other years it's been better, but it's generally allowed them to grow and mostly save some uh, time and labor contributions. So it's the one that's, uh, one that's out there and you're starting to see people use this model a little bit. Uh, but again, these were, they are sort of unique situations where people have kind of known each other for a while and can come together and, and work together, which is a little bit difficult uh, uh, sort of when we've always been running our own businesses. And then with that, uh, there's, kind of a, there's kind of a quick highlight through some of the life cycles of the farm planning that's out there. There's certainly a ton of options and everyone's got to come up with something that's a little bit unique and, and different for what they want to achieve. Uh, but basically, a few other things to consider, uh, like Brenda had mentioned as well this morning, uh, having a plan B. So having that discussion, I find, about what if this doesn't work out? Um, how do we uh, make sure that everyone still gets along, that we can get uh, everybody out of this is a good thing to have. The next gen, I mean, again, I've been working with, uh, again, on the crop side a little bit more, but uh, uh, you've, got, uh, you've got your input loans, you've got your equipment loans, you've got your land loans. Uh, again, uh, like a young dairy farmer I'd mentioned, uh, you want to be careful on how much debt uh, you've got so that uh, so you can make this work. And I think it's got to be a common goal for the whole business. Uh, at least that's what, uh, when my dad watches the video, I want him to know. But uh, again, uh, good accountants and lawyers, they are there, they do help. Um, again, there's a great community here in Olds of, of good advisors as well. So with that, I think planning is one of those things that because there's so many options, so many different things, making sure we start early and that uh, we're not necessarily just saying, oh, we'll just, I'm going to leave it all to my spouse when I die and they can figure it out with what they're going to do to the kids. So the will's not the only way to do this. And so with that, I uh, just want to say thank you for, uh, for listening to me at least. And then uh, if there's any questions, I'd be, be happy to take them. And if you want to talk about your plan, uh, feel free to shoot me an email. And